Welcome to module five, lecture four. So far, we have looked into issues of fresh concrete and of course the production process. And in the last lecture of this module, we look at the two important aspect of the aspect of handling fresh concrete, namely compaction and curing of concrete. So first we talk about compaction. Why do you need it at all? Then generally we use it vibrators, so something about the vibrators themselves. Then mechanism of fresh concrete under vibration a little bit because we have discussed quite a bit of it elsewhere earlier. And then we will talk about execution of vibration again briefly. And uh, lastly, we will talk about curing, need and method. So, let us talk about compaction and that is you do usually do by vibration. Now, I mentioned this earlier that placed concrete contains air voids up to 30 percent. You know, if it is of course dry concrete, not we are not talking about very highly flowing concrete or self compacting concrete. And also, we said that it seldom conforms to the shape of the foam. So, therefore, compaction is required to drive the entrapped air out to densify the concrete and also to increase the homogeneity and uniformity. You know, this has other benefits, but largely to entrapped air has to be driven out and concrete must be densified. So, that is why we need vibration. This compaction is achieved of course by vibration, that is what we mentioned earlier too. Now, concrete vibration, well, energy for compaction is supplied through oscillatory motion of vibration, which is nearly simple harmonic motion. We can measure the frequency of such vibration in air, but it is difficult to measure within concrete, though it is more relevant if we can measure the amplitude of this vibration. So, energy of compression is supplied to vibration, oscillatory motion of vibration, and it is generated by means of rotating eccentric, having a frequency and amplitude of vibration. So, it is essentially all types of vibrator are actually in some kind you know is basically moving eccentric uh, having frequency and amplitude generates the vibration and this oscillatory motion which is generated which is simple harmonic motion causes air to drive out. We will look into the mechanism of course. We can determine the frequency of the vibra vibrating machine or whichever I use the equipment uh, in air. But within concrete is difficult because the effect of the damping and other things, uh, the, the interaction of the vibrator or, or you know vibrator component which is you know vibrating component with the concrete is difficult to measure the frequency there. Now, we have generally two types of vibrator classification internal vibrator and obviously external vibrator, but internal vibrator themselves are again classified into three types. We will not discuss all of them because it is it's not, a, it's, it's not on machines, but most commonly used one of the internal vibrator is the flexible shaft type, right? Flexible shaft type. Other one is of course the vibrating machine, but the motor is handheld and from there power is transmitted straight away to the vibrating component. Then there are air vibrators which can also be internal vibrators, but the most common type is a flexible shaft type. Once in a while you might see an electric motor in hand and it is uh, the rotating part or the eccentric which actually provides vibration is just connected to the motor. The external vibrator is foam vibrator which vibrates the foam and also I can have a vibrating table generally used in laboratory or in precast you know uh, well cast for precast elements for precast elements. So, you have a table which can vibrate 
and you put your mold and the concrete and therefore the vibration uh, takes place there. Form vibrators are relatively more common uh, but most common is of course the internal vibrator of the flexible shaft type. So let us see what they are. There are some surface vibrators used for floors, vibrating screeds etc etc which are you know floor vibrating for floors or flat surfaces, slab etc etc. Immersion or sub, most common is the immersion type of vibrator which are called immersion vibrator or submersible poker or spot type. They have flexible shaft and other one is motor in hand type. Let us see quickly how do they look. This is a, a three types which can be there. For example, for example, you can have a bearing here, flexible drive shaft which is normally a spring which can rotate, spring which can rotate actually, a shaft is by itself is a spring which will be rotating connected to a motor and then there are the bearings and this is the, this is the, this is the eccentric mass, this is the eccentric mass. So this is the eccentric mass, mass or the eccentric shaft, there is a bearing here, bearing here and this rotates eccentrically, this rotates eccentrically causing oscillatory motion, circular oscillatory motion and the concrete in the surrounding will be actually subjected to this oscillatory motion of the vibrator which actually pushes the concrete somewhat and then again uh, it is the, you know, it's released. So there is a kind of uh, compression of the concrete and then there is a kind of rarefaction because this will be moving in simple harmonic motion. So this is one type. The second type is pendulum type where the mass is here. The flexible shaft is here which is actually as I said a string is connected to the bearing but there is a rod. There is again pendulum shaft. Now this pendulum shaft is connected to the mass, eccentric mass and this eccentric mass again causes oscillatory motion, you know, which rotates and causes oscillatory motion of the, oscillatory motion of the vibrating uh, you know of the needle that is there. So these are also called poker vibrator, needle vibrator, they have all flexible shaft and here the motor is here, electric or pneumatic motor is straight away here. So motor is here, is cable or hose simply, it is cable or hose, if it is pneumatic then there will be air hose, so air will compress, air will come through this and here is a, you know air will come, compressed, it will get compressed here, eccentric is also similar. These are not very common, this is a very common type very common is this kind, this type and even this may be quite uh, useful. So this is how they work. So this is how they work actually, the uh, the needle vibrator as we call it. So this portion of the, this component of the equipment, this component of the equipment, actually this component of the equipment, it goes inside the concrete and causes oscillatory motion around in the concrete around which will be compressed and rarefied and so on and so forth, radially going outward uh, longitudinal waves or as well as it might be generating other kind of waves also but largely it will be generating longitudinal waves and maybe some transverse wave too but causes actually um, you know um, kind of uh, uh, oscillatory motion spreads around over a, over a circular uh, radius of influence over a circular you know circular area having a radius of influence. So what you do you shift from one place to the other and uh, uh, one place to the others and then uh, it's you know go on vibrating the concrete as they are. This is flexible shaft, shaft type is the most common and its diameter can range from 20 millimeter to about 180 millimeter. So Usually vibration is generated by means of rotating eccentric as we said, having frequency and amplitude of vibration and uh, uh, basically uh, um, uh, frequencies etc is available, data is available. So dimensions are from 20 to 80, 180. Now we can look at this head dia of this needle 20 to 40 mm, where will you be using this plastic concrete thin section, right? This will be, you will be using it in plastic concrete, P stands for plastic, T stands for 
thin section and congested reinforcement. So we have C stands for P stands for P stands for plastic. P stands for thin section and C stands for congested reinforcement. Congested reinforcement. So you see thin head dye are 20 to 40 mm. 20 mm is used in thin section. For example, web of a uh, let us say web of a box section, some web, thin box, you know, thin web, about say 100 or 150 mm, 100 mm, 100 mm or 150 mm thick web. And you have a lot of reinforcement here, plus a pre-stressing cable is passing through. So it's a thin section. Now concrete has to be plastic because if it's a dry concrete, you will not be using this. Now uh, recommended frequency, of course, in kilocycles is given as 10 to the recommended frequency in kilocycles per minute. It's given in, that means 10 to 15,000 kilocycles per minute is the recommended frequency. And you can see as your diameter increases, this diameter increases, frequency reduces. So this is high frequency, this is lower frequency, all right. And average amplitude is low here, average amplitude is high here. So average amplitude is high, frequency will be low, average amplitude is low, frequency is generally uh, higher. So radius of action is 8 to 15 centimeter in this one radius of action is much more so where you want to use where you want to where you have a thin section where you have thin section plastic concrete congested reinforcement you might use this while this is might be used in mass concrete you can see its radius of operation is quite high and compaction rate is also fairly high so where you have large mass concrete of course you want to vibrate it then you might use massive massive section you want to use this for example in dam mass m stands for massive concrete so mass concrete in dams you will be using in between if you see 30 to 60 very common is about 66 mm somewhere around this this is very common slump less than 75 mm it's suitable for that kind of concrete relatively stiff not very stiff this is absolutely plastic you know maybe 100 mm slump or less than, it's just below pumpable concrete, let us say. Pumpable concrete is quite flowing, but pumpable concrete itself, if you are compacting, then it should be, it should be, uh, use, you can use this also. But in thin section, larger section, of course, you can use this one. So plastic concrete, wall, column, beam, you can use 30 to 60. And this range, as you see, it reduces here, 10 to 15, 9 to 13.5 and so on and so forth. And average amplitude increases along this direction. This becomes lower. This increases along this direction. This increases along this direction. Radius of action increases along this direction. So this increases along this direction. And compaction rate also increases along this direction. So 80 to 150, you will be using actually mass concrete. Slump less than 50 mm. Slump less than... Uh, 50 mm and uh, this could be on you know uh, basically a relatively drier concrete one may use this so that's how one chooses the needle vibrator foam vibrator are external vibrators transmit transmits impulses both in plane and perpendicular to the foam so what you do in this case you have the concrete here you know, this is the concrete side of it. You put the foam vibrator here, right? And it is fixed. So it is fixed here, foam vibrator here. So as it vibrates, it transmits vibratory wave both in this direction as well as this direction, both in this direction and causes vibration. So again, it will be rotating eccentric. So it causes foam to vibrate, right? So both in plane and perpendicular to the foam, it actually transmits the vibration. I deliberately didn't want to put in a figure because then I'll be going too much into the equipment part of it. Now form is vibrated and vibration is transmitted from the form to concrete. Its acceleration generally ranges from 1G to 3G for adequate amplitude. Both rotary and reciprocating types are used and can be electrically or pneumatically driven. So basically you can have both, you know, a rotary type rotary and reciprocating type and uh, can be electrically or 
you know numerically operated and you can see the rpm so these rpms if you can see the rpm kilocycles per minute is 6 to 12 kilocycle there's 3 to 6 kilocycles per minute 6 to you know so if you look at the earlier one earlier cases so this is relatively large higher side on the higher side for the larger needles use uh, you know the frequencies if you can go back if you can go back to the previous one so you can see that if you remember this is if we go back to this the 10 to 15 the first smaller one was using thinner ones were using higher uh, high frequency so this is somewhere in between right so that's what it is so this is uh, uh, form vibrators quite often we use them in thin sections we use them in thin sections where we can't use uh, uh, where we can't use really uh, poker vibrator or needle vibrator you know the first ones so when you can't use them then we can use this or when we are using them together with this this is used so vibrator form vibrators are used in thin sections it's not the best thing thin form vibrators are not definitely not the not the best of the kind of vibrators uh, because some of the energy will be lost in vibrating the form itself so that's not the best one uh, Needle vibrator obviously does a much better job because it's an internal vibrator and go inside and uh, compact the concrete. Thirdly, the vibration will be limited up to certain depth from the form only. The other kind of vibrator that is table vibrator, vibrating table are usually used for precast element or for laboratories. Frequency is less than 6000 RPM. Uh, you know, vibrations per minute and amplitude is less than 0.12 millimeter. So, this is precast element can be used for precast element, one can use this. Sur surface vibrators exert their effects at top surface and include, of course, the vibrating script, pen type vibrator, vibrating roller script, vibrating plate, and vibratory roller for pavement concrete. So, they have their specific use for. You know, specific use this uh, surface vibrators. So we have seen where we select the needle vibrator of what dimension, right? Now we can look into uh, foam vibrators. Where do we select them? Where it's impractical to use internal vibrators, or it might be supplementing the internal vibrators. Vibrating screeds are used in thin slabs. High frequency and low amplitude vibration generally results in more efficient compaction. So that is what is the thin, you know, if the thinnest of the needle vibrator actually is most effective, but its radius is also low. So your effort in moving this is will be relatively high. How does fresh concrete behave under vibration? Let us see. As we said, Prior to compaction, concrete is a mass of separate particles coated with mortar held in a pile by an arching action of coarser particles. You know, if you can recall, it will be something like, if you can remember, it will be something like particles of different sizes and shape heaped up together and uh, you have, you have actually mortars in between you have mortar in between so you have mortar in between it's like a pile of material with mortar in between so the red is the mortar black is the aggregates i put it spherical aggregates they need not be so so the mortar should be somewhere there so it remains like a hip it, it you know it's like a it's like a hip it's like a hip it's like a hip mortar held in pile by arching action of the coarser particles so the, basically there will be arching action one supports the other and uh, one particle supports the other actually. Now, as you, you know, this should be, this actually should be, it should be able to, you know, it should, it should get, it should move and get, get, get the shape of the mold. So what you have to do? You have to see that this particle moves downward, this particle moves downward, you know. So you have to see that this particle has to move downward. This particle has to move there and get the shape of the mold itself. So, arching action of this one, they actually hold the particle because one particle is touching the other. So, by friction, by friction, you know, one particle is touching the other. So, by the friction, they are just in position. So, actually, their fall, the gravity, fall due to gravity is uh, restricted. 
or obstructed by the friction between the particles. So you have to overcome this friction and how do you overcome this friction? So one has to overcome this friction and let's look at our uh, next statement. The arching is result of friction between aggregate particles, surface tension of cohesive forces are same and paste. Of course, since it's a paste is uh, in liquid or plastic state, I mean it's in plastic state, therefore there's some surface tension and cohesive forces of the cement paste that will also held in position the particulate system itself in the heap. Now you got to overcome this. So the this arching actually results in a void of uh, air of about 30 percent because you know these are the particles are particles are something like this and there is water as I said so but there will be air gap in between. So there will be air gap in between there will be some amount of air gap there will be some amount of air gap in between so this air gap air gap is about 30 percent air gap is about 30 percent so you have air gap somewhere in between this particulate system and this air gaps are air gap and there will be about 30 percent 30 percent air gap will exist and you got to drive this air out so that is the idea that is the idea of vibration so what happens Vibratory impulse actually liquefy the mortar portion of concrete and thus reduce the internal friction resulting in consolidation by force of gravity. Then once it is vibrated, concrete, you know, vibrated completely, the friction is re-established and cohesion is restored and strength increases. Now how does it occur? So vibratory impulse essentially causes the water or the you know water particle in the cementitious system or paste system uh, which can vibrate more which actually moves more than the solid particles and more the constricted the next sag you know it will exert more pressure and this pressure actually overcomes the friction resulting in a kind of collapse of the system so the velocity of compression waves generated could be of the order around 45 meter per second in the beginning of vibration and increase to 240 meter per second at the end. So essentially liquefaction of the mortar occurs that's because the pore, water within the pore system would vibrate more or move more than the solid particles and cause an excess pressure in the system and that reduces down the friction or overcomes the friction within the particulate system and uh, results in you know results in uh, results in uh, mobility or movement of the movement of the particle and uh, also drives out the yeah for 200 hertz, hertz the velocity this corresponds to about so wavelength is of the order of around 0.2 meter to about 1 2 meter wavelength that's of course the thing the waves moves water more than the solids that's what i'm saying and generates hydraulic pressure within the interstitial water cool spaces and this pressure is maximum in most concrete constricted space and cause, causes reduced internal friction giving the paste temporary fluidity that's what i'm just saying so this water within the constricted space because of the movement it exert pressure and that overcomes the friction and that's about by the that's how the particle moves right that's how the particle moves the process of liquefaction is easily understood through, let us say, box shear test, which we do, done in, which we normally do in soil. Now, this kind of tests are also con conducted in concrete, long, long back. And one would see something of this kind. See, one would see something of uh, this kind. For example, you have shear strain along this direction and shear stress along this direction. You have shear strain along this direction and shear stress along this direction and shear strain along this direction. Now you apply normal pressure sigma n and tau is applied from this side and strain is measured delta divided by h this is h and delta is this distance so if you measure the stress versus strain you find this sort of curve and this depends upon sigma 1 sigma 2 so as you increase the yield shear stress actually increases so normal force higher normal force yield shear stress actually increases higher normal force yield shear stress increases. So concrete people have done box shear stress and this is the kind of behavior which normally one would see. And then like soil, you can actually put shear stress versus normal stress curve and this is your normal stress, this is the shear stress and 
this, it can be related linearly. It can be re related linearly like this. So therefore, tau yield shear stress is a function of tau zero at this point, the intercept plus mu into sigma, since this is a function of mu into sigma. So you see the yield shear stress is a function of yield, what is yield shear stress? That was this one that was shown here, that was shown in the previous diagram. This is the yield shear stress, yield shear stress. It increases with sigma, it increases with sigma. So as sigma increases, yield shear stress increases and one can linearly relay, relate this simply linearly relate this and uh, this is tau zero at uh, zero normal stress and of course you know uh, this is a tensile strength of the whole thing normal tensile strength so mu is a this slope and sigma is a sigma is a normal stress now mu is equals to 10 phi phi is what is angle of repose so mu is equals to 10 phi and there's the angle of repose this we know in soil, this is what we see. So concrete, drier concrete almost behave like soil and people have studied this. And shear stress strain relationship, this was before vibration if one measures. But supposing I measure this during vibration, what will happen is if I forget about the drooping portion, the strain softening portion, for same sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, stress strain curve is something like this. But when I vibrate, stress strain curve goes like this. That is during vibration, the stress, the yield stress reduces significantly, yield stress reduces significantly and, uh, you know, the stress strain curve becomes something like this. Stress strain curve becomes something like this. So, if I may look at it again, this is, this was the case prior to, this is mu, this is my mu and this is, this is my mu and uh, this is, this is, this is the, uh, you know, tau y is equals to, uh, you know, this, sorry, this is the tau y is equal, equals to tau zero mu sigma before the, before vibration. And during vibration, what happens is, before vibration, during vibration, what happens is, actually there is yield shear stress reduces significantly, right? Yield shear stress reduces significantly. And uh, uh, after certain period of time, you find that, you know, like yield shear stress actually reduces significantly, tau reduces significantly, depending upon, of course, sigma value. So my sigma, this is my sigma, so after an increase in the sigma value, you find that it behaves almost something, not, not exactly parallel to this, but in some value like this. So when your sigma is applied, sigma normal is small, is small, yield shear stress is, yield shear stress is for small sigma n, for small, for small sigma n, sigma n, tau y is small during vibration. This is during vibration. So during vibration, it behaves like this. During vibration, it behaves like this. And uh, up to certain sigma value, up to certain sigma normal value, practically there will be no yield shear stress. Now, this is actually the, the sigma, this sigma value corresponds to actually equivalent force of vibration, equivalent vi force of vibration. What we call is, this we call, we call this as, you know, we define this as agitation pressure. So, the agitation pressure, if the normal stress is less than the agitation pressure, which is actually the slope, if I extend this line, this is during vibration. So, if I extend this line, this is the normal stress that will correspond to agitation pressure. So, this is agitation pressure. So, during vibration it is like this and you can go back to this diagram again, earlier diagram again. So, this is agitation pressure here. So, if your normal stress is more than the agitation pressure, then only you find that yield stress starts increasing. So, the result of vibration yield stress, stress reduces significantly. But mu, of course, the slope of this one, slope of this one is more than the original, than the original, than the original. And after vibration, actually it stiffens, the yield shear stress has gone back to higher some value. Once you stop the vibration, it's because the cohesiveness is re-established and that's how the behavior is. So, it would again show up, uh, you know, uh, it will show up the uh, swap the strength part of it. Same thing is shown here. 
during vibration, before vibration, and after vibration. So this angle also increases. This angle, this is more or less similar angle. This is more or less similar angle. This angle is similar, while this angle is less. So actually you are 10 phi mu sigma. So the 10 phi actually has increased, angle of repose has increased. That means it has, it can stand on its own more stiffer in a stiffer angle. And this diagram also shows you something like this. This is before vibration, during vibration you start vibrating, your shear stress comes down very significantly and then you stop, again it re-establishes itself and that's how it is. So basically when you're vibrating, your shear stress comes down. Therefore, particle can move, particle can move, shear, you know, movements due to the shear force can occur, it can move over each other or slide over each other, shear uh, flow would be occurring actually and then uh, due to this, it can, the air will be driven out and it can get the right kind of shape, shape of the, shape of the mold itself. So that's the mechanism of vibration, that's the mechanism of, so fresh concrete, consolidation actually occurs in two phases. In the first stage, vertical settlement of coarse aggregate takes place in a manner similar to packing of granular material and shape of the aggregate plays a major role. Air voids up to 5% remains after this. Spherical particles will actually easily roll over and therefore, you know, uh, five, if the first stage itself, vertical settlement becomes easier for rounded aggregate. Then you have at the end of the second stage, concrete behaves like dense liquid because the air voids have re been removed quite a bit and finally air voids are removed from the surface, forcing water to appear at the surface, forcing water to appear at the surface. So this is important, this is important to understand or know that uh, water will appear at the surface. You know, once the air voids moved out, the water will appear at the surface. So, it, you know, once once you have first phase is over, second phase, uh, second phase, actually water will come out and that's also a test for the whether the vibration is complete or not. You'll find that the slurry or motor phase is coming out at the top and then you can stop vibration. One can measure the unit weight by various density gauges and they typically look like this, unit weight, time of vibration, so this is your time of vibration and unit weight. So after certain period of time, vibration is complete. In fact, somewhere here, the motor would have come out right at the top and after that you need not look into any further, the vibration is over. What you shouldn't do with respect to vibration? You see, this is the correct type, this is the incorrect. So needle vibrator should not be penetrated in an angle. This is incorrect, this is correct because you know, they will be dragging the, the concrete along this direction. So by and large it should be vertically put down, it should be vertically put down and if it is on a slope surface, it should be done, you know, from this the concrete is over, there is, here you place it, so you do from the bottom and go upward. So it is desirable that one does vibrating, right, vertically downward without inclining, without the inclination of the needle. It is not desirable to incline the needle and do it. And one should not push the concrete by vibration like this being done here. So that's some do's and don'ts with respect to vibration. It should not be moved using internal vibrator and which can result in segregation. That means penetrate vertically to sufficient, vertically to sufficiently embed it embed in concrete, held stationary and remove slowly, say 7.5 meter per second, centimeter per second is a good velocity, slow velocity, but one may not be measuring them. But the idea is that when you are taking out the vibrator, it should be taken out slowly. It should be done at regular spacing to ensure compaction of all portions with adequate overlap. There should be adequate overlap. I mean, typically it should be like this, if this is the radius of action, which is known for types of needles that we talked about. The second one, needle location will be here so that there is the right kind of overlap. So this is the overlap. So overlap should be like this, overlap. So right kind of overlap should be there. In other words, if I have sections like this, where I have one circle covers it, or thinner section, you know, it covers maybe something like this. The next one should be, next one should be something like this and so on. So that overlap is here overlap is here. Next one should be something like this. 
So there should be sufficient overlap. Sufficient overlap, that's the idea. There should be sufficient overlap, right? There should be sufficient overlap. That's the idea. No left portion should be left blank. Minimum usually 10 seconds is necessary for complete compression. Vibration time needed is given by some equation. I think I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that because equations, nobody is going to use it but much. But we understand that at least 10 seconds if you keep it and when you see the motor has come out, uh, 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 motor has come out as and and you know motors has come out you pick it up pick the non middle vibrator just lift it up slowly at a very slow velocity and you can see the slurry right at the top for of course shutter vibrators uh, which are fastened with the foam vibration time is two minutes to 30 minutes depending upon concrete and vibrator itself so they require longer period of time more energy screen needs of course two passes and degree of vibration achieved by surface vibrator, of course, one can see from the figure that is there. Actually, up to only certain depth, only up to certain depth vibration is. So it's about, about something like about, you know, um, 8, 10 centimeters from the top, which means that 80 mm and not really, uh, not really much. After that, the density reduces down. So it's only the top portion maximum can reach, you know, you can actually vibrate. Similarly, shutter vibrator also will not go throughout the section if the section, section is thick. So uh, that's what it is. Right. Now, imperfection in vibration, vibrators, uh, honeycombing. Actually, it should be in vibrations, actually. In imperfection, due to poor vibration essentially so in in vibrators is not the one in vibration you can say concrete vibration honeycombing if you have not done the vibration properly but it can have uh, you know it will have stony and air voids can have generally happen in narrow sections and uh, grout loss can also cause this if the forms are not joined properly Free fall, low slam concrete, this is a concrete type, and poor vibration can result in this. Well, blow holes or bug holes, which you see normally in concrete, uh, small holes, aesthetically ugly looking. Excess form oil, if you are using, you can have this kind of thing. Lean and low slam concrete, you get it, and of course, inadequate vibration. So, poor vibration can result in honeycombing. Inadequate vibration can increase the bug holes formation. Bug holes are pretty common. They are not very harmful, but they look very ugly. Not a good finish. Subsidence and cracking, of course, uh, uh, this can happen uh, due to plastic settlement. Now, it's a bleeding concrete. This is, can occur in concrete which is bleeding. You know, because which is bleeding, the water comes up and the solid subsides. So, this can happen and inadequate vibration can result in this. High water content is the usually the concrete cause which can be so in high concrete concrete which has got high water concrete content you might get short cracks the cracks looks like this in fact sometime we might be discussing over reinforcement sometime you might see just over the you know this is the concrete in fact if it, it might look something like this so the top concrete surface might look like this there is a crack and then there is a subsidence there is a crack and so on and so forth so you have reinforcement here this is a concrete surface this concrete, so in the concrete surface, so let me draw it just here, let me just, just here, you know, it, it can, it can look like this, this is, then there's a crack, then there's a crack, so it's usually quite often could be over reinforcement and then several other situations, this is my concrete, so this is a slab, large slab and similar sort of situation, you might see some plastic settlement cracks just over the rebar, just over the rebar, you know, just over the rebar. Uh, you might you might you might see them just over the reinforcement bar so this is plastic settlement crack it comes when your water is too high plastic settlement crack plastic settlement for high water content and inadequate vibration so 
where you have high water content, if you have done inadequate vibration, you might still get this, still you might get this. In fact, I mean inadequate vibration is also a cause, not the primary cause, but uh, it's also a cause you can see. Uh, form offset, of course, it has nothing to do with the vibration. So I'm not just, you know, if your form is, have not been bolted properly, this can result in uh, defects. Cold joints formation, that's also inadequate uh, vibration of the lower, lower level. You know, cold joint occurs when you have two, one concrete, old concrete, old concrete, and then you have new concrete, which is over here, new concrete. So there can be cold joint formation. And this is inadequately vibration, vibrated, you might have cracks coming in or cloak or weak joint forming here if it is not vibrated properly. So uh, that's it. These are the defects which can come for vibrations, imperfections that can come from vibrations. Special vibrations are vacuum vibrations. Revibration can be done as long as running internal vibrator sink. So if your internal vibrator, if it sinks in, into the concrete, and penetration resistance of around 3.5 MPa. Now, penetration resistance is a measure of setting. Penetration resistance is a measure of setting and it should be 3.5 MPa. If it is more than that, then you cannot use it. Can increase strength, bond, impermeability, reduce shrinkage and creep. So, revibration is not desirable, but you can do it if it is to be done, you can do it as long as the concrete is not set and it's measured by penetration resistance. Vacuum vibration is accomplished by applying vacuum to surface of fresh concrete. Cement paste is densified by removal of air from the surface and water from the certain depth. Now this is applied where you, you know, vacuum, vacuum uh, dewatered concrete, uh, where floorings, abrasion resistance, high abrasion resistance, like warehouse flooring or industrial flooring. So this is done where you are likely to have a lot of abrasion. Basically water is removed. This water is used for placing the concrete, but it is removed. So water cement ratio is low and you get relatively strong concrete. So placing concrete with higher water content by extracting extra water, then you extract the extra water. So in strength is improved, commonly used for slabs, walls, vacuum between 30 to 50 centimeter of mercury applied by means of special you know, liners of material which you allow water to come out but the solid will keep. So you have a mat placed on top of the concrete and then water is evacuated out. You know, it's through the vacuum water is taken out. Uh, it should be applied as early as possible. Penetration of vacuum is up to about 30 centimeter is less efficient in air entrained concrete because then air will come out. Fresh mix subjected to high frequency vibration over 100 hertz uh, is called vibro activation, increases the strength by intensifying hydration, generally does not have anything to do with compaction. So if you have used high frequency vibration, then hydration process increases, not, not nothing to do with the compaction. Right, so these are special cases. Now let's look into the second part of our discussion that is curing. You know, uh, Hydration reaction is not instantaneous. It's not like an explosion reaction which is instantaneous. So it occurs over a long period of time and therefore water must be available for hydration. Now for hydration to continue, you need a relative humidity of 100%. Besides, there will be loss of water by evaporation and it shall be prevented. And if you can't prevent it, it should be replenished. You know, you may not be able to pre prevent it, so it should be replenished. Then some water will be consumed by the chemical reaction itself. So what we call is self-desiccation. And this also got to replenish. So essentially what happens is reaction requires longer period of time and occurs at only 100% RH, so you must maintain 100% RH. Water by loss of evaporation, loss of water by evaporation occurs and that has to be replenished to maintain 100% RH. And self-desiccation also would cause some water loss and that should be also replenished and also sometimes maintain conducive temperature. So this is the purpose why you need curing, you know, need for curing. Well, most important is if you don't do this, if you have inadequate hydration occurring, the capillary pores in the system which we have discussed earlier, if you, if you can recollect, we have discussed earlier sometime, you know, uh, cement 
between cement hydrates, uh, outer product, etc., etc., and you will have uh, unhydrated cement system. Uh, unhydrated cement is somewhere there. Then there will be capillary pores, interconnected capillary pores in between. You know, you will have capillary pores. So, this capillary pores which you have discussed earlier, they need to be segmented. Now, only when you have sufficient hydration product, only when you have sufficient hydration product, they will come and touch each other from both the sides and capillary will get segmented. So, minimum curing is required in order to ensure that capillary gets segmented. Otherwise, unsegmented capillary will result in poor durability of concrete. So, if you have not done good curing, what will happen? Obviously, strength development would not, would not be there because hydration has not occurred. A lot of spore space will be remaining and drying shrinkage can result because the water has gone out. So, it can cause drying shrinkage and this can result in cracks. Maybe aggregated by high ambient temperature and low, low relative humidity. Poorly segmented capillary, capillary results in lower durability of concrete. So, this is what is the effect of curing. Now, how do you do curing? We do moist curing. Supposing I got a water cement ratio of 0.5 concrete and if I cure it, continuously submerged. This is continuously submerged. The strength will increase in this manner. Give it 28 days cured, strength will increase in this manner. 14 days cured, strength will go like this up to 14 days and then it will flatten out. So, 28 days strength will increase nearly up to or 20 days a little bit, then it will flatten out. Continuously moist cured will go like this. Continuously in air, of course, strength development will be much less with time and uh, 3 days, so up to 3 days there will be increase slightly more than 3 days. So, what happens is when you have stopped curing, after that hydration proceeds for a little while and after that there is no further strength development. So, therefore, you know, strength development I need. Compressive strength is a function of curing age. And if I continuously cure it, moist cure it, continuously moist cure it, then this is what I get. You know, it increases significantly, continuously it will go on into it. So, that's what it is. For strength gain, I need some amount of minimum curing. You know, more the moist curing I do, I'll be gaining this. And strength will be good. Concrete will be gaining this way. Methods of curing, obviously water curing is the number one. Ponding, spraying, that's how you do. You just, if it is a slab, if it is a slab like this, if it is a slab, you know, concrete is here. So, you make some sort of a barrier, some sort of a barrier here on both these sides and simply do, you know, uh, ponding, simply do, simply do ponding, simply do ponding, simply do ponding. So, you have ponding, water here, water is so, these slabs you can actually do ponding, slabs you can do ponding, ponding, ponding can be done on slab. Spraying, spray with uh, kind of any kind of uh, pipe and then covering with wet sand. So, instead of ponding, what you can do is you can just put in sand particle here and this has to be maintained wet. Or you put wet hessian clothes, clothes or absorbent covering. So, this could be for slab or for columns also. For example, if it is a column, you can put actually wet hessian, you can put wet hessian here, hessian clothes here, which will remain wet all the time. So, you keep it wet, wet, with some kind of absorbent cover. So, this is one, you know, moist curing is done in this manner. Then you have got foam retention and covering concrete prior to setting. Of course, you can retain the foam, but that will not be replenishing the water or cover the concrete prior to full setting or even after that. So, water water actually will not go away, but at the same time, water will not go away, but at the same time, you know, it will not replenish the water. Membrane curing, basically you apply resins or and waxes on top of the concrete to form a ready, you know, membrane. It can be sprayed or hand brush applied, let us say. So that what it does, it will see that no water goes out. Whatever water is inside, that is used up. So no evaporation. So both second and third, you know, this one and this one, they will ensure that there is no loss of water, but then 
there is no loss of water, but then they will not replenish the self desiccation water. So, these are the methods. Then you have steam curing, waterproof plastic sitting, some people have used, and steam curing. Steam curing is used where you want to get accelerated strength. Maybe pre stressing you are doing, so you want to do the pre stressing quickly, and that is what where you use this. Moist curing. If you see compressive strength, you can compare the compressive strength. You see 28 days, you know, this side is for different water cement ratio. So, you get uh, you, the comparison is ponded and hessian. So, this high one is ponded, this is this is hessian cloth, this is hessian cloth, hessian cloth is somewhere here, hessian cloth is here, ponded is there. So, hessian ponded. So, ponding does a good job, ponding does a good job actually, ponding does better job, ponding is here, ponding is here and hessian is relatively less, hessian is lower one. So, hessian is lower one and this is for one day, this is for three days, this is for 28 days. So, ponding does a better job than hessian or you know putting an absorb absorbing uh, water absorbing uh, cloth or something cover. You know. So, cylinder strength ok basically what do you want to see is the qualitative because quantitative values does not make much of a sense it will vary from concrete to concrete. So, hessian you know ponding is a good thing when you have the facility and also there is a possibility of doing. For example, you can do ponding on slabs or horizontal members, particularly large horizontal members, but you cannot do it on column. Curing by former covering membrane of course, stops evaporation which I said, but do not replenish the moisture loss due to self desiccation that is a problem. Now, you need a minimum days of curing for segmentation of the capillary and it depends upon water cement ratio. For example, water cement ratio 0 0.4 it is just 3 days and for water cement ratio 0 0.7 it may take 1 year. So, higher the water cement ratio more days are required to segment the capillaries. It is understandable because more higher water cement ratio larger size will be the capillary pores and more will be the capillary pores and they will be more connected you know they are beyond percolation threshold. So, all of them will be connected. So, code actually specify minimum curing days based on this for example, Indian code says that 7 days minimum curing is required for uh, ordinary Portland cement, but if it is pozzolana blending then you will need 10 days in normal weather, but correspondingly you will need 10 and 14 days in normal weather and of course, uh, dry weather like uh, desert areas where you know it is more dry, there will require 14 days when you have pozzolana blended cement, but pozzolana blended cement or they will require more number of curing days for strength development because that process is slow. So, that is what I am saying IS 456 recommendation at least 7 days for OPC, 10 days for blended cement, concrete with mineral admixtures in normal condition, but for dry and hot condition these periods are 10 and 14. Other codes are actually much more elaborate, I do not have time here to talk about those, they are much more elaborate, some of them would talk about the curing depending upon water cement ratio, also the kind of uh, evaporation losses possible, air velocity, you know they, they this, uh, for example, uh, our style British code was quite elaborate in this aspect. Our code is part, uh, is much more simple and simpler. Okay, so that's what it is. What about temperature? Concrete cast and cured at the indicated temperature. Let us say this is this is you know this is basically temperature is thirty degrees centigrade one day age. So age of age and this is twenty eight days. So, if you cure it at let us say 10 degrees centigrade strength is here, 20 degrees strength is here, 30 degrees strength is reduced, 40 degrees strength reduced. So, if you look at 20 days strength, cure it at 40 degree will be less strength than cure it at somewhere around 20, 22, 23 degrees. Similarly, 3 days strength and so on and so forth. So, it actually you know higher temperature early strength gain is high, this, this is gone, this is almost close to that higher temperature early strength than high, but later 28 day strength it is actually reduces down. So, maximum 28 day strength you are getting at 20 degree centigrade when you are casting and curing at the same temperature all right. Now, we talk in terms of something called maturity temperature effect 
what has been what has been uh, seen is that t measured about 11 degrees centigrade and if you mul you know for let us say t1 delta t1 so it was maintained at delta t1 t1 for delta t1 time t2 for delta t2 time etc etc and sum this up this is what is called maturity and it has been seen then maturity log scale degree centigrade days versus compressive strength can be really linearly related so higher temperature lesser time you will get almost same effect when you have uh, lower temperature and longer period of time that's the idea and that's the that gives you the idea about steam curing that gives you the idea about steam curing so we'll just look at steam curing steam cured concrete if you apply immediately after you know it is in if you apply immediately after strength gain is poor but uh, if you maintain it at 74 degree centigrade you are somewhere here in this curve 54 is somewhere there 31 is somewhere there 91 strength gain you don't get so compressive strength at different you know age it is given hours 72 hours three day strength so somewhere around 74 or so degree centigrade you get strength good strength in three days if you are looking for very high temperature doesn't give you very high strength generally steam curing steam at atmospheric pressure will have uh, low uh, you know it will have about 75 80 degree centigrade so what you do is you don't apply immediately because then strength gain you don't get so there is a delay period this is the delay period then there is a steam heating period maintain the temperature you know supply the steam and maintain it then cool it so basically something like 5 to 20 so if you do it for about 15 to 20 you know 15 to 15 hours 13 14 hours of steam curing you can develop you know this is the kind of practice that we do we get good strength all right so string steam curing is something like this typical steam curing cycle and this is if you are trying to get early strength so you can summarize now basically we have looked into uh, basically we have looked into all the methods of compaction and then uh, you know the mechanism how it how the compaction occurs uh, and lastly then we looked into curing the methods of curing need for curing importance of curing that's what we have highlighted one thing the curing is very important from durability purpose which people quite often ignore it's good for strength development but the minimum curing is absolutely essential uh, for uh, durability we quite often try to you know you ignore it also because of the kind of uh, uh, practices that you have if it is a sprinkled one continuously in a precast factory that will be good curing but in situ when curing is done quite often it is uh, ignored it would be the most unskilled person would be doing it now such curing do not help the system the strength will be lower durability also might be affected another contractual problem is string in indian scenario Curing is always part of concreting. So obviously it is not a separate item. So therefore also the strength development figures. So that's all as the summary and uh, you know summary of uh, also the module 5 where we have looked largely into the fresh concrete issues and concrete production process. The curing completes it. Thank you very much.